I'll start over. Welcome to the data science working group meeting for Wednesday, July 17th. As a reminder, we are under the chaos code of conduct. So please be kind to each other. We do have a few things on the agenda. So let's start with the event location inclusivity project update. If there's, if there are any updates for that project or things you need help with or anything really. Quick update if you want. Yeah, go for it. We um, have not met in a few weeks because we had a break and then, yeah. So um, we will be meeting, I think, next week. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, we've been chatting with folks who are running events uh, to get more data from them. And yeah, I think it's good. It's going really well. I'm excited about it. I think we're making good progress. Nice. Yeah, we each um, spoke to um, we spoke to three different people in the open source event planning area, um, and just to see if this would be something that would be beneficial to them. Um, and if not, that's also good advice to to know whether or not um, this metric is useful. That's awesome. I personally, I, I, I'm really kind of excited about, about this because the event location stuff is really, I mean, it's not easy, right? It's, it's a complex problem, but I feel like it's something that's really, really important. So yeah, I'll be interested to see where this, where this goes. Cool. Anything else on event location inclusivity? I was going to ask, um, and I could understand, like, why not? But for this metric, is there any plans of, try of like, integrating? I'm trying to think of how to exactly word this, but, like, pretty much, like, if the region has safe policies for, like, like government policies for all members, because um, I think that's increasingly becoming a problem. People talk about it a lot in the U.S., um, but what are the laws in that area. Yeah, that is part of that metric. Um, okay. It's the, there are different maps that have, or different organizations that are kind of keeping that data, um, but not all of it is kept in a central place for one. And I don't know how, uh, how deep the data goes that's available out there. And also it's yeah. tricky because there could be there's state laws, but then there's also like city laws and city cultures within that state, like Austin versus mm -hmm. Texas is very different, you know, so like, it's just complicated. <laughs> it's just oh, complicated. yeah, that's why I was like, I was yeah. asking more out of pure, like, it's not an easy, but it's like, it's not an easy problem to answer, but it is, I mean, it's probably the thing that is talked about the most right now when it comes to events is because there's been such a major change in the last couple of years, so like specifically in the US with how like where things are hosted and whether people feel comfortable or not going to those regions. Yeah, it's so true. And the, there's a couple of challenges too, because that a lot of the organizers who are hosting the bigger events, especially have to book it out so far in advance. Mm -hmm. and they're booking it out like five years. So who knows what's going to be going on in five years from now in that location yeah. for one. And then the second part of that is that if we avoid those locations altogether, then those folks who live there never get access to, to conferences yeah. and they always have to travel. So that's also a bit of um, something just to consider. Yeah. So. Like, oh yeah. Hard. It's like, those are the things of like, yeah, there's not like a good or a bad, but it's more that it feels like, for the for this metric, I hope there's a way to include that since it is such like it is probably the most talked about thing whenever it comes to events right now. And you have that five year window because, I mean, there's probably most, if not all of us were in Austin when Roe v. Wade got overturned, like while we were at OSSNA. Yeah, that was um, fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. First first solo talk. An hour after Roe v. Wade got overturned, that <laughs> didn't do anything to my mental psyche at all. Um, <laughs> I had the same issue. <laughs> oh, 
Kelly the same problem. I was like, okay, I'm not distracted. I'm giving the best talk of my life right now. <laughs> so yeah, I get it. Um, but yeah, so that's what we're kind of hoping with this with this metric is that we can provide tools that just help organizers in general weigh all of the factors and bring mm -hmm. it all together in one place if we can. You know, I don't know yeah. we'll see how that works, but um, we're, we're we're trying. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and I'd add I'd add that like we've been thinking about this for a few months now. We've gone through so many different factors and in the weeds, out of the weeds, and trying to think through how would this look like. And and so I think after we kind of kind of looked through all the things we could potentially look at, then we said, well, who would this actually like affect? Who who like who are our stakeholders? Who would actually use this metric? And so we thought, let's just go to them first and see what they think. And then that will pretty much drive where we could go with, you know, uh, with this metric and then what data we would potentially need to get there. I don't, the other thing is, I don't know if, um, I know Linux Foundation recently, or not recently, but in the past year or so, created a new, like, I don't know how they call it, sub foundation or another foundation under them, but um, I think it's called Overture um, Map Foundation where they create maps uh, or they pull in a lot of open data um, to create visualizations. Um, I'm, I've been following them, but I haven't seen too many things um, that come out of them. And is there anyone here that knows about them? No. Um, yeah, I don't know anything about it specifically. I just know that I've always been, you know, I've been, this is, Partially, I think, I forgot who, where this originally came from. I think it's actually Greg Sutcliffe, who works pretty close to so doing a lot of data and metrics for Ansible. Um, cautions very heavily against mapping, like, contributors. I don't know if this necessarily does that, but, like, mapping locations of contributors, because if they are potentially in a country that there's any type of, like, trade like permission any laws that would bar them being able to be a part of the community there's no there's no onus to to look to know that but if you do know that you have to remove them um and so that's something i don't know though if like the this map project is about contributors or just like mapping things in general I didn't know that. So one, that's good mm -hmm. to know. Yeah, it is um, good to know. Like there is no legal responsibility to find out, but if you do know you, then you have a legal responsibility. Okay. I think for this, um, for Overture, they just do general mapping. I think they pull in a ton of data. Um, and I think they work with like Esri and some of the big mapping uh, folks, TomTom, Tom, maybe Mapbox, I'm not sure, just to pull in data to create maps. Um, but I, I, I was just curious if anyone here knew more about them, because I, I only follow them a little bit, but not much. So yeah, I think that's pretty much from the event location project. Uh, next up, we have Project Exodus. Yes. Um, I'm curious. I haven't even gotten to take a look to see how much things have been filled out. I'm going to guess not too much. Yes. The answer to that is what I would expect. <laughs> this is like I'm trying to figure out the right. I definitely want to wait to give another like two week cycle to get more responses because I've had a reminder on my like, calendar for weeks now being like remind people and then every week I'm like well everyone's gonna be out this week so I shouldn't rem uh, so, so I should do it next week and then the next week comes and then I have the same exact um, response but I think at this point like we're more into like the meat of summer if people are out for a month because they live in Europe and get to have nice things um then that's just going to happen but at least being away from like the beginning of July where you have so many people out and so I'd say for this one I want to wait another cycle to move on to the next step which I see as like 
okay, let's go through this in a meeting, figure out if we see any trends and seeing if we want to start looking at a couple of different ones with people, like kind of the send off like thing for the next time being like, okay, let's look at these different communities using the tools that people usually use to look at their communities and see if anything stands out. But I want to give a little bit more, um, just a little bit more time to put in some stuff. Cause I know people have been out. It's been in the in and out revolving door since this was introduced. Yeah. It's hard to make progress on stuff like this over the summer for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already <learning> that. <laughs> <laughs> Callie, do you think um, we should just throw projects on there and then based on kind of a pattern, um, a definition of Exodus would come out of that? Or yes. is there a definite? Yeah, okay. Yes, I would say, I would say that's like, and I'm, I want to try to make sure I make that clear whenever I send this out next time that like, throw anything in the kitchen sink on this initial list, like anything you think could fall under this and then let's see what comes out. I think that you point out, and I think we've discussed this before, I forgot of like really that first step of, of this once we kind of get a lot of examples is to, I think defining for the realm of this research project, what does Exodus mean? What are we going to be looking at for this project? Listen, I wonder if we can take Dawn's um, list of relicensing and see if the ones that were relicensed oh, yeah. had mass exodus or exodus. Yes, I think that's a good call. I'm gonna put a note down. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then, like, we can add another column that said, like, maybe reason for Exodus. And for those ones, it might have been the license change. But then for some of these, it could be, like, I don't know, um, new acquisition or change in market or just flat out abandon. I don't know. That. Yeah. Um, cool. Anything else on Exodus? Um, so, so you mentioned the license change data set, which is something that I've been, I've been thinking about and related to, I think the Exodus conversation. Um, one of, one of the things that I've been spending a bunch of time on, well, not a bunch of time, something I've been thinking about a lot is, um, uh, forks that have resulted from license changes. So this is something that um, for some reason, Stephen Wally and Amanda Brock are both uh, um, friends of mine and talking about this a lot. And um, so I've been reviewing some of their blog posts. I gave, I, I don't know why this has come up all of a sudden, but I gave a talk at an open source uh, open UK meetup a couple of weeks ago on forking. And, and then, you know, Amanda and Steven are working on these, these blog posts. And so for some reason, there's a lot of discussion around forking. And I was talking to Steven earlier today about kind of contributor data around the projects that have relicensed and then had forks, like how much of the uh, contribution base was really by the employees. So it's something that we're, we're starting to to think about. And I think Stephen and I are gonna propose a talk for member summit about, about forking. But what I'm thinking about doing is adding, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether I should just add the fork data to the license change data set directory in the repository, or if we should keep, because I feel like the, the forks tend to happen. Uh, hey, Sean, can you mute? There's, there's- Oh, bond, sorry, yeah, it's done. Kind of from yours. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, so my, my, my question is, um, if we create a data set and start gathering a bit of data around, around the forks, do we, 
should we put that in the license change data set um, folder? Because I feel like most of the forks lately have come out of license changes. Although that didn't used to be the case. Like a lot of the forks came out of acquisitions. Sorry, I guess I'm sort of thinking aloud with, with all of you here. I, maybe it's a different, maybe it's a different data set. I don't know. What do people think? I think a lot, I mean, most of the forks that I know of as of recent have been because of license. Like I feel like license change is usually the the trigger that they're like people are like, okay, right when it happens, they take a fork and I would say honestly, like it seems like from a that a lot of times nothing ends up really coming out of it, but there is at least like an initial fork and then sometimes there is it's kind of like I feel like almost every major license change, there is like a competition of like which is which fork's gonna win. And then after that is like, does that even matter? Is like the next phase of the fork. Okay. Um, yeah, because it didn't used to be true. So like license changes are a relatively new um, reason to fork, but almost all of the recent forks have been as a result of license changes. So I feel like we're looking at we're looking at license changes because they often generate forks. So maybe maybe I will just keep those together. I can always split them back out if, if all of a sudden it doesn't make sense. But then hopefully any data that we gather on the forks, um, you could use as part of the input for the exodus. Yeah, yeah. and I'd say that almost all cases that I, every case that I can think of right now, it's either a license change or a policy change of some sort. Like whether it be like, I know this never ended up coming out to anything, but when Red Hat announced that they weren't going to be, nobody quote me on this in the recording especially, but whenever they announced the change in RHEL, because they used to provide like a very packaged version of it with each release, and then they decided that they were no longer going to be providing, the source code was available, but the packaged version wasn't. Um, there was like a put like open ELA was like something, a fork that came out that ended up having no activity or community, but it was more of more or less a marketing thing, but it was like a fork that came out that gap garnered a lot of news, especially at the beginning. And it wasn't a license change, but it was a major policy change. Yeah. I mean, some of the historically, some of the big forks, um, have come from, from other things other than license changes like uh so acquisitions so oracle yeah. acquiring sun was the the driving force behind the maria db uh fork of mysql and the libra office fork of, of open office and then there's um there's another one this i don't know if this is really a policy change but a dumpy air was forked out of Compier back in 2005 or six um, I happen to work at Compier. Nobody even knows who that company is anymore. Um, but it was it was forked because the uh, the founder of Compier, who was the one who had written all of the software, just didn't really um, wasn't really interested in accepting contributions from other people. So other people were just like, we're out. We're gonna take it. And we're gonna run with it. Um, but he he open sourced it for the wrong reasons. A friend of him, a friend of his, convinced him to open source it basically for marketing purposes. And then he didn't. I don't think he really um, was prepared for a lot of people wanting to make contributions. And uh, he had a very specific vision for where he wanted this project to go. And other people's contributions just weren't weren't aligned with that. And so he was just like, I'm, you know, just didn't didn't take contributions. Interesting. Yeah. So some of the so the older forks happen for very different reasons. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to look at. It's probably something I'll spend some time on in the fall. Um, I'm looking at the most forked repos on GitHub, and it's kind of it's pretty interesting. I'm going to send a list. Okay, so so yeah. actually, so what what we're talking about is actually not GitHub forks. Uh -huh. um, so it's it's GitHub forks uh, is super confusing. I don't know why they called it that because it's not um yeah, it has has nothing to do with with what we're what we're talking about. These are these are projects that have um yeah, 
I wish they hadn't called it forks because this gets super confusing every time this comes up and I don't know why they why they called what they do forking. But these are basically projects that spun out, completely spun out of other projects. So like OpenSearch did from Elasticsearch. So those are the types of forks that we're talking about where- Was OpenSearch still not a fork of Elastic? It is a fork of Elastic, yeah. But it's a fork but like in, not in the context of a GitHub fork. Yeah, but then technically they still had to click the fork and then yes. like rechange the project. So it technically still is a GitHub fork, right? It is still a GitHub fork. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But we can't look at GitHub forks to, to better understand this because anyone who contributes to a project has to fork the project as a part of contributing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. see that difference. Yeah. Sean. I, I just, um, on the subject of these forks and things like open search, what I've observed is happening behind the scenes is the projects that fork these other projects are actually manipulating and changing the Git history. So you end up with repositories with multiple conflicting Git histories and only one of them survives. And this, when you look at those projects using like Grimoire Lab or Augur, you have to be very careful to make sure that you are dealing with the fact that there are repetitive issue numbers, repetitive pull request numbers. And, and so the GitHub data gets really mashed up because of these conflicting commit histories that exist. And you have to do a commit log to actually find this like this. So there are some issues that these forks do create when it comes to understanding the health and sustainability of the projects, because the data gets uh, converted to a state that is more difficult for tools that we use in chaos to understand uh, unless we've adapted them, which we're in the process of doing that with Augur because we've found a couple of these cases recently. Yeah, and they they do that because primarily because of trademark issues. Um, I yeah, because I I was a bit involved in open search towards the beginning, and I'm friends with the community manager there, and so we've we've talked a lot about about open search. But in the beginning, a lot of a lot of what they were doing was um, because they they forked it and then didn't release the source code right away because they had to clean up all the trademark stuff. Yeah. Um, and realistically, the only way you can do that is by manipulating the Git history. Yeah, I, I think it's just important since for what we do that we understand these weird anomalies exist yeah. and we have to deal with them. Yeah, and the other the other interesting thing about about forks like this is that you you kind of have to ignore you actually kind of have to ignore the Git data from before the fork happened because that data is the previous project. It has nothing to do with, with the new project. So this was something we faced a lot when we were, uh, when I was at VMware because uh, Greenplum was um, actually a fork of Postgres. Uh, it's interesting because I haven't actually thought about that one as a, as a fork and now I need to go and look at that. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna give myself a note. Um, yeah, I, re I think this is really interesting because I wonder if there's a way where you can see if, so like some of the big forked to alternative projects that we're talking about have had media around them, right? So people are talking about them in the community, there's articles written about it, they're, they're kind of on the larger scale. But then there are still a ton of projects out there that maybe only people in those communities are talking about that are being forked to alternative projects, but at a smaller scale of just, you know, under 100 people who are talking about it, but might not get media attention because it might not be impacting companies and stocks and whatever it is. I wonder if there's a way where you could, like, look like, find the fork in a date and time or and then like the project that was forked out and like if that project ended up getting more stars than the original project or more stars and more forks if that could be some kind of metric to say that this spun out to a better bigger alternative project i don't know 
Yeah, that was actually something I just looked about looked at. I'm just gonna pull up my notes. Um, I I looked at for some projects around um like like if you look at at the um Maria DB fork of of MySQL. Um so right now, so like MySQL has 10,000 stars on GitHub and MariaDB has about half that, so like 5,000, um, which isn't surprising. So given that uh, MySQL is still owned by Oracle and still pushed quite a bit, so it still has a ton of user base. Um, but MariaDB is also popular. So this is one of the cases where like they both became popular. But if you look at the contributor data, MariaDB has almost 400 contributors and MySQL has only 100 contributors. So if you look at some of this data, it gets uh, it gets really, really interesting. So yeah, Tan, that's a really that's a really good point. That's one of the things I think we should definitely look at. Yeah, I wonder if we could dig through more of that in the Exodus project of like looking at each of the case studies um, and then even um, looking at this arm of what Sean is talking about on like what do we know about the commit history for those? Um, and then, and then, yeah, and then contributor data as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, Kelly. I, I assume those are the sorts of things that you're hoping to look at for the Project Exodus. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because I think, I think we'll probably look at maybe similar data for the uh, no, it'll be a little bit different. I think the data that we care about for forking is probably a little bit different than the data that we care about for Project Exodus. But I do see like the fork data as being a subset of, mm -hmm. of what we need That's to exactly how I see it. Yeah. But it's also going to be interesting to see because it's like, in this scenario, is there a mass? Like, in this, I, I think part of it is going to be in these situations where we think there should be an Exodus, is there actually one? I think that's a part of the question as well. And then I think that's almost more interesting if you have like here, here are 10 forks and only and eight of them had a large percentage of their contributor base leave and two of the like seeing the disparities between the two will honestly probably provide even more information than if, I mean, it will be, it will be useful if all of them have the same exact behavior, but that's not usually how these things work. But being able to see, okay, what is the difference between these two things happening. And I think that'll make us like understand this a lot more. Yeah, and I think it'll be really interesting to look at how um, how the different reasons that the exodus happened impacted it. Um, because you definitely saw a big exodus of contributors, both from, from MySQL and from OpenOffice when the uh, MariaDB and LibreOffice forks happened. But but like you said, like I said earlier, like MySQL has continued to be relatively successful from a user standpoint. It just doesn't have a robust contributor contributor community. It has Oracle employees who contribute, um, but MariaDB has a has a robust contributor community behind it, and so it's it's a bit different. And then the exodus around Open Office, like Open Office still exists, and they cut releases, and you could download it. But I don't know anybody who hasn't switched to LibreOffice. It just seems to be the much more, much more popular, popular choice. So like the, the exodus happened both from a contributor standpoint and also from a user standpoint from OpenOffice. I'd be curious to see if there's like any ties to like the profitability of the, like the, like whatever, like pretty much like the, whatever um, products come from this of one of them, it's like MySQL, you're saying that like still has a strong user base, it's just Oracle versus this one has, it does release, but it's pretty dead. I, I wonder if like the major portion of that is whether the company that holds, like, that is, like, has the most influence in or depend or has a product based on it, if they abandon it or not. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true because that's what happened in OpenOffice was they basically, they didn't care about OpenOffice when they acquired Sun. And they they just basically let go. They let, let the whole open office team just they had a big redundancy, big layoff um, of of open office contributors. So they just basically got rid of most of them. And so so yeah, the the 
the company caring about it was a made a big difference in what happened in the end. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how everything the dust settles with everything with VMware. Um and all the pro yeah. I mean that must be horrible for you. Like it's just like it just like sucks. I'm glad you're outside of it, but it doesn't mean that it's probably not like difficult to watch. It's it's super hard to watch. It's a little it's a little heartbreaking to be honest, because I have so many friends that were working on open source that have been let go um and are struggling to find find new jobs because the project they've worked on for years, all of a sudden nothing's going on there. Yeah, it's sad, but yeah, we'll see what happens. I will be really curious to see what happens with those open source projects and whether others others pick them up. Um, I was wondering if, um, yeah. I was wondering if, Callie, if you'll be here in two weeks, because I'm wondering if in our next meeting, um, if we can actually take one of the projects that you listed it, you listed in the Exodus Excel sheet um, and just walk through one of the cases and just do like say if it was open office like like start to dig through it as a group it's um because some of the things don don's mentioning are things like i would never know if because yeah I, I that's a great idea. It. and that might be like a portion of these meetings for a while i could see especially the ones that like go under both of these where it's like okay let's spend five or ten minutes here's the example everyone's doing their individual searching and googling and mentioning stuff that they they find and like yeah i i really like that idea and i could see that being something we kind of do going forward for a bit with like okay. the project the other thing we do need to add to the agenda, um, and I'll I'll just make the connection um, to you, uh, Chan, because I was I was talking to um, Miguel from Baturgia in Madrid a couple of months ago at a data event there, and they're doing some really interesting things around um, risk models and some like. Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what it was because it got mentioned in one of the presentations. They were like, oh, well, you know, Miguel's working on these risk models and they talked a little bit about them and I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was, sounded really interesting. And so I started chatting with him about it and I was like, you know, you really need to come and present this in the data science working group. And then I am sad because I'm going to miss it, um, but I will watch the recording um, because he's he couldn't do today. He had another, he had a conflict. So, um, so he'll be... He'll be here on the, the 31st. So I think that would be a really good, uh, really interesting piece of the agenda. And then we can probably use the rest of the agenda to talk about some of the Exodus projects. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I think I can reach out to Miguel. Okay, there. perfect. Oh, you probably know him from like chaos cons and things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But his 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 Slack handle is, is just hard to find. Um, <laughs> So that's why I put it in the notes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, what's new in data science? Oh, sorry. I didn't talk about the other data science projects. Was there anything else anybody wanted to talk about before we go to the next agenda item? Okay. okay. I feel like we're talking about the ones that we've made progress on. Okay. I just added that one in there just as a one that, I don't know if it's one that we want to talk about today, but I wonder if we can start thinking through like, what, what are the new things that are happening? Um, what are things that we could bring into this working group? Are there trends? Are there projects that we should be looking at? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I I feel like for me, I haven't been like I've been more on the open source OSPO um, conferences and you know followings, um, but which has taken me away from a lot of the data science stuff that I've been um, that I, that I had re previously been going to, and so I feel like I haven't caught up in like. Well, what are the projects everyone's talking about right now in data science, or what are the the new techniques or trends um, that are going on? So 
again, we don't have to talk about now, but it might be something um, worth keeping on the agenda for other meetings. Yeah, I mean, it's not directly data science related, um, but there have been a whole bunch of, of conversations around um, open source AI and how you define that. So the OSI has been working on a definition for quite a while. They they have a draft out that then a lot of people are really, really not particularly happy about that's generated a lot of blog posts like Julia Ferrioli uh, wrote about it. I think... Uh, one of the folks from Red Monk, I think, uh, wrote about it. it Might have been Stephen O'Grady or James. Um, and so there's been a lot of talk about how you define open source AI and do you include the data in it or not. And the conversations are are basically along the lines of you have to include the data because people need the data in order to replicate it. Um, and if they aren't willing to give you the data, they're probably using illegal data to, uh, you know, to create their models. Um, and and then the other, other uh, I guess, uh, part of this is that you really can't ask people to provide all of the data because that from a practicality standpoint is, is just impossible. How do you provide all of the data that was used to train these massive large language models? Um, and so it's it's really interesting to see those those conversations go back and forth. Um, because like it's it's really not practical to include the data, but people feel like it's important from a open source definition perspective. Sean, uh, just you mentioned the use of illegal data, <clears throat> the creation of um, large language models or AI in general, and honestly, I I don't think there is anyone that even knows if they have the rights to use the data that they're using to construct the models that they're building because yeah. they don't care, because the models entirely obscure how they build them. So it's kind of a catch me if you can problem right now in, in practice. I'm not saying that's right in any way, but it is what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's all. <laughs> I was just gonna include a couple of links from the, um... And I, I've just been thinking about this because I just happened to have recently read a few articles about it on people's blogs. Go ahead. I think I just cut somebody off. No, I, I agree. I feel like it is a catch me if you can. Um, it's just happening so fast. And I don't know how people are going to be able to keep up with it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, actually, I want to wait until we close this topic, and then I'll. I, I just realized that what I was going to say would be a complete tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still along the lines of what's new in in data science? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's go ahead because we only have about five more minutes, so let's let's do it. Yeah, I what I was going to say is that I've been. This kind of goes along like when it's like what's new in data science. It's like I've been trying to do a little bit more professional development lately, like looking into like, okay, I've been so heads down and like the stuff that using in Aspen, like what's gone on that's like outside of the scope of what we've worked on. Um, and it's like, oh, a lot, obviously like MLAI and it feel, it's like the more that I think about it, it's especially whenever it comes to AI that it's like, people are viewing like AI as like the next step of data science and like you don't need like data science and data analysis anymore because you have AI but like you actually think about like even just like very specifically to how that applies to like chaos like and all of the visualizations and all of the metrics and all of the complexities of what we analyze and look at to understand communities better AI can't do that AI can barely like Re, like comprehend like synthesize information that is written in very like cut and clear cor like correctly and so it's this really weird thing to be like in the data science space specifically right now with ai because it that's what it's like what it feels like for a while it's like oh i need to figure out ai and then i'm like back like i'm like taking a step back but it's like honestly ai doesn't interest me very much which is very unfortunate for the time and space that we're in so i'm like i need to find this interesting um because it's whatever it's like the center of everything but it doesn't 
it doesn't replace like it's like it feels like a lot of times it's like in a lot of ways ai does replace some of like ml but like the line between what is like machine learning and what is ai is like okay but in my opinion data science and ai and ml actually has a pretty clear distinction at least in my head um and you can't replace like data science work or a large majority of it with ai in, like in my opinion but it seems that's like what's happening I think it's what's happening in the minds of managers and people that are trying to achieve some kind of mark in the industry. But it's like a, it's like a gold rush, and really the only people winning right now is Nvidia because they're selling shovels. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have this conversation so many times with people because people hear, "Oh, you're a data scientist," and then all of a sudden it's just like just all AI. I'm like. I don't actually do any AI. Um, I don't even really do any machine learning. Like I do a lot of helping people uh, get insights from the data that they have. That's that's kind of what I what I do. And yeah, people just assume that you spend all day doing AI if you are a data scientist, and that's just not not true. I was also it was really interesting. I was talking to um, a woman who has been working in AI since I think like the seventies um, or eighties. Like she's been working in AI uh, really kind of forever. And she was talking about how irritated she gets because everybody's like, oh, chat GPT, large language models. She's like, there's, there's so much more to AI than chat GPT and large language models. Like this is, this has existed forever. Like her, she said her, her favorite example is like, um, like the stuff in your car that you don't even think about every day. Like the you know, the thing when you're, when you're backing up and it's, you know, beeping at you and doing, doing things that really is like based on artificial intelligence, but it's not, not what people think now of artificial intelligence. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Cause this is really the first like major, like tech boom since I've been in the industry. So I've never seen the hype set, like something like this, like peaking happen before. And so it's just going to be just interesting to see how all of this, like how the dust settles, especially for data science. And like, I feel like it's more of like, okay, when are people going to actually realize the limitations of AI and like that it can't just replace everything. Like that's, I, I think we're in more informed spaces, like especially like people who've been working in data. Like I think the, the branch is really just working with data is really the branch that like brings all this stuff together. People who've been working with data for a very long time, I think, or just have experience with it can see and understand of being like, oh, these are the use cases where AI language models is, is useful. Like parsing through documentation. That's, well, that'd be the thing that I'll always say is gonna be the biggest thing with with AI when it comes to coding, is that everyone knows how difficult it is to parse documentation and learn and do things and understand like what you're doing coding wise and language. And I think that the apple like the application of large language models to specifically that and finding what you need in documentation is going to be huge. Um, but like it's not going to replace software engineers. Everyone has read like it's just that's just not how this is going to. Or I guess I could be wrong, but that's how I see it. Um, but people who are closest are already kind of like seeing like, oh, here are the boundaries of these are the use cases that is useful. This is the use cases that like maybe. And then here's the, like people are now trying to just like make stuff happen where it's, this is not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just going to be. Yeah, it's just going to be interesting to see how long is it going to take to realize that like you can't make strategic data driven decisions using AI. Like. For them, I mean, I maybe there's a specific application, but in general, most of these use cases are incredibly like to the point that we like, I won't even do a scoring system for open source because I'm like, this is like not going to be like, this is going to be misleading a lot most at best, most of the yeah. time. Like, it's just, it's, it gives me a, I can, as you can tell, I could go on about this forever because. I'm dealing with the brunt of the AI hype cycle yeah. and it makes me want to throw my head against the wall a little bit. <laughs>
Okay. On that note, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, we do have a couple of reminders. One thing I wanted to mention in the general Slack channel, um, if there, if you want to write a blog post, do a podcast, um, promote something on social media, we, we have a little form for that now. Um, so I encourage you to use that if you have stuff that you want to talk about. Um, Open Forum Europe is holding their Open Forum Academy, um, not in Europe, but in Boston um, mm -hmm. in November on the Harvard campus. So Callie, this might be interesting to you. I would yeah. have a look at my blog post last year from, from OFA and you can see kind of the stuff that they talked about. Um, but it's an interesting mix of policy people, researchers and practitioners. So it was like OSPO people, policy people and people doing research on open source. It was interesting. I really, I really enjoyed it. So I would encourage yeah. you to submit something because the, the yeah. deadline is August 7th. All right. And thank you. Because this is going to be like less than a mile from where I live. <laughs> oh, nice. All right. So you should su you submit something and let me know how it goes because I'm not going to go this year, sadly. It's just too far. Um, member summit deadline, August 30th. And then if you have ideas for things you want to do for the podcast, we have an email for that. And with that, I think we're, I think we're good. Thanks everyone for a good conversation today. Yeah. yeah thanks everybody. Bye thanks, everybody. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.